drink. Hello, everybody. It says we're live. Um, it does, and I can I can say good evening at this point because I'm still good, in. Good evening. Thursday. Yes. For two more minutes. Uh, for two more minutes, though, according to the signage you've got on there, we're in post show, not pre show. Oh, oops. Yeah, no, it's been a day, <laughs> folks. Like, uh, Misty, it's all over. <laughs> was it good for you? <laughs> just kidding. We just we just started. Yeah, that was the easiest show I've ever done. Um, let's see, bringing up my monitor here to make sure that yes, we are in fact recording and we are in fact live. So that's always encouraging. Uh, hi everyone. We are um, talking about driving self-driving vehicles, autonomous vehicles this evening. So is this just going back to promoting the idea that the patrons could fund my uh, my next Tesla? Your Tesla, yeah, I, absolutely. I say next Tesla. Yeah. I haven't had a Tesla. It sounds like I've had a few. No, I, I, I would. I would this quite is, like this is your fifth Tesla, right? <laughs> yeah. So they're, they're just like, <laughs> falling off the driveway, you know. Oh, that Patreon money. Yeah. <laughs> oh, if only. Uh, we laugh because we don't see a dime of that like in our own pockets. Like that's why yeah, we laugh. Right. Uh, it all goes back to the production of the show. Um, I don't think people realize how little, uh, like like we don't pocket anything from the show, or we, I don't. We, Barry, we, Barry might. I've invited him as a guest, and so he might be on the side uh, collecting donations. I, I, I've got I've got side hustles. And okay, for, for all sorts <laughs> of bets about when we say stuff, and yeah, I'm I'm at the mint hour. No, not at all. He he links up our yeah. our content on his channel and uh, monetizes it, and so he. <laughs> oh, see, that's a G. Why didn't I think of that? I'm sure there's, <laughs> there's got to be a way around, a way of doing that. I've got no idea. Um, if I was clever, I might be able to do that, but not so much. So uh, yes. Anyway, we are talking about what self driving vehicles and making them safer for pedestrians uh, because yeah. that is a huge thing that needs to be considered is the safety of pedestrians. We always talk about safety of self-driving vehicles. Uh, and tonight it's all about the pedestrians. Um, Which is good because they are part of, they are part of that ecosystem. Um, so yeah, I, 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 we kind of get the feeling that they are becoming second place, <laughs> literally second class citizens um, to that. So this is, this is quite interesting. It's actually quite interesting as well thing because it's actually fairly fundamental research really um it's something that you thought we would already know it's like things that we've covered in the past where you think don't don't we know this already and actually we don't um, yeah yeah uh let's really see. I th look. Go sorry go ahead i'd say we should really look at some it came from as well i've yes we should so um we <laughs> met just briefly before this and <laughs> made sure that all of our notes were good um i do yeah let's let's look for it some it came from I've thrown, so I'm gonna... I've thrown four in there for your consideration. Oh, awesome. Um, you have four so... in there for my consideration. Let me, let me take a look at those really quick, because if those end up being great, then we not, might not need to search for uh I've, I've taken them there fairly they're recent ones. So. so this is next. I have an interview for a PM role. Focused design systems at Spotify. Ooh. Um, so this is talking about moving from a designer to more of a PM role, or I guess we could approach it from like the researcher perspective or human factors yeah. practitioner from to a management role. Yeah. That's what yeah. I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. That one's interesting. Um, I like it, but yeah, let's, let's use that as a springboard to talk about, uh, management <laughs> and, and oh, moving. Not, or just not, don't do it. Um, <laughs> what's that? Oh, just don't do it. Um, <laughs> don't move into management. <laughs> push back as long as you possibly can. But anyway. I mean, you know, it's it's for some people, it's not for others, and that's okay. You don't have to. And it, it's one of these things. I I like cussing about it, but um, I do enjoy it. It, it is it is good fun. It's, uh... Oh no! I just realized my uh, my camera is doing the thing again. Give me a second because I. You want to get a new one? I, I told you which one to get, and everything. I know. Well, hang on. I have a story about it. Give me a oh. second. I'm gonna be <laughs> just just one moment. Okay. So clearly, Nick's uh, fed up with my company already. So that's great. I'm just going to sit here and do the show. I wonder if I can just knock him off, and so he doesn't come back. That'd be interesting. Hang on. 
Uh, oh, we can still talk though. That's 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 somewhat disappointing. I can hear you too. I'll say, where, where, where's the mute button? It's the, uh, oh, what we we were, we were talking just before uh, Nick hit live about uh, what could what could be the worst thing that goes wrong, and we might be going down that route now. So. Anyway, good evening to everybody who's listening. If you are listening, drop us a comment. Um, drop us on the comment on whatever social channel you're using, because by the powers of modern technology, um, we can see that problem here. And you, um, we can give you a shout out. Um, and say you're hi. hustling. I, know. I love it. So, Thank you for well, hustling. <laughs> might as well talk to myself, because you, you clearly ran away and didn't want to play anymore. Um, oh, is, that, is that new camera or just a, a reboot? Just rebooted. It's just rebooted. So here's the story I have about this camera. So I I think we talked about this in either one of our pre-shows or the, it came from section a couple weeks ago. I segment my life uh, by yeah, yeah. two computers. Uh, I have my work laptop and I have my fun other laptop that I use for things like podcasting and gaming and web browsing and all that stuff, right? The utility laptop, the catch-all. And so right now I'm plugged into the catch-all laptop, not my work okay. laptop. And the way I do this is through one cable that plugs into a USB-C. Okay. I just swap everything. So that way, you know, as I as I get to my work laptop, all of my uh, my my mic and headphone setup is still there. My webcam setup is still there. Except when I plug in my webcam to this dock. It doesn't like to work on this machine. And in fact, it sometimes uh, um, sort of freezes up. So I think it's a problem with the dock and the webcam interacting. Because right now I have it plugged in directly to my laptop. And it usually is fine when I do it that okay. way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's where I'm at with that. And that's why it's uh, such a weird thing. And sometimes many, you'll see it and sometimes you won't. How many other things have you... How many other USB things have you got built into the dock? <laughs> and if you got uh, a lot of things, a lot of things. Yeah. So let's see. Here. I got a problem. I... I've, I've got a USB C dock as well. And when I got my, it's sort of when I started getting the the Rodecaster deck, that's when it started falling over. Mm -hmm. And so I've had to limit what goes in there just because the amount of um, connections it takes. Because each device takes more than one. It isn't a one to one relationship. Right. So I have two external. Uh, hubs plugged into the hub of the universal dock. So the dock itself is a hub, and then I have two hubs off of that that are powered by external sources. Yeah. Um, so if you think about everything that's plugged in, you know, I have my keyboard, my mouse, my webcam, my microphone, um, which also acts as an audio driver, and so therefore my headphones. Um, I also have at one point, I had things like a hard drive reader and uh, a printer and uh, a million other things that I didn't really need. Um, so right now, I think it's just those. So really not that much in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Yeah, because I had I bought myself a different USB hub that actually I can switch the uh, different USB devices on and off individually through the hub. Oh, so yes. Same here. Yeah. Um, which is, I find, kind of useful um, at the moment because I've yeah. got my Stream Deck switched off because that was taking up apparently two s slots or whatever it is. Um, and so I've switched that off to basically run the my deck through the hub as well so I didn't have to hook, to hook two or three things in. Because the amount of times I'll come and do a podcast, I forget that I need to also plug the, um, the mixing desk in um, by USB because it isn't going through the hub. And yeah. I keep on forgetting to switch things on. Yeah, and then wondering why it's uh, not, showing, not showing up in, in the well, computer settings when it's not actually there. So if we want to get in the weeds here, if you're on Windows, you can. There's a setting that in power management that you can, or device management that you can do to say, um, allow my machine to manage this device for power management or something. You check that off, so that way it does not siphon off power to those things as it's yeah. trying to ration its battery or you know okay i think something yeah 
A lot of this isn't to do with power. It's the amount of data cha- data, USB data channels each USB mm. will, will take. Um, so the apparently the road will. So my mixing desk will take. Um, so, rather, so I don't know how many there is, but say say the twenty twenty channels uh, data channels they can use in the bandwidth. Then you know the some devices will. It isn't a one to one. So some devices will use four channels each, um, and then so they they all stack up and then. USB C is limited to however many it can take, um, which was a, it's a really bad description, but it's something I read when I was wondering why half my dev- half my devices weren't working. Um, so that that's a limiting yeah. factor as well as the power. Anyway, computer problems, man. All right, yeah. uh, let's. I'm I'm looking at some of these other uh, it came from's interviewing for a design system role. Uh, what the best way to prepare a structure to follow. Oh, it's great. Um, it's the, um, it depends, really. Yeah. So, <laughs> the design um, system, articles, videos, courses. Okay. So they're looking for resources. Yeah. Maybe we'll skip that one. Um, what's the next one here? How to organize and share interview data. Uh, I feel like we tackled this one fairly recently. Okay. Um. I'm not opposed to it. I just felt like I feel like we tackled it recently. Uh, yeah, so, so maybe as a like optional, if we don't find anything else, um, and then difference between product designer and brand designer. Hmm. Which I quite, I, I thought that was quite interesting because the whole brand for me, the whole brand designer piece is, you know, the literally the branding and at that level. Um, whereas obviously a product designer is is much deeper. It's around the entire product. It's not just about the uh, the image of it. So. Right. Product uses brand, but brand might not necessarily use product. And well, also the, the other way around. If you're just designing a a straight uh, wireframe on Figma, you might not you might not put any of the brand information in there at all. Yeah. You might just be developing the product, and then you then you uh, splash the brand over it later. Yeah. All right. I, I can you see that. Getting really angry. So. Let me take a look to see if there's any. Let's see here. So when did we last go on? Was 11. So let me start there and work my way down just to see if there's anything good in here. There's quite a few of them. Uh, there that, is. I've only got halfway down. So. Was, uh, yeah. Um, let me know. There we go. See, heat mapping seems to be really popular at the moment. Seems to be quite a few. I've seen it come up in a, in a number of different conversations over the past week, actually, as well as it being on here. Um, How do you feel about talking about salary? Not specific numbers, just yeah, yeah. Th- this question uh, here. Uh, question for senior designers, or I guess in our case, researchers or human factors practitioners who have recently moved to a new company. Are you seeing upticks in salary due to hot job market? Um, yeah, I mean, I, this is this is a, a good question to talk about kind of negotiation of salary and going into it with expectations. I, I kind of really like that and think yeah, and also the job market in general um you yeah. know is there loads of positions open is there not because i mean there's there's loads of positions in the uk um we so we're desperate for more and more practitioners um yeah i see a ton of stuff over here too um well i've just taken on two new members of staff so it's um I've, I'm, I'm full at the moment oh you are full okay i was about to say if you're hiring you know you could always post want, that in like our Slack or something. If you want to come over and you want a new job already, then <laughs> you, you, you're just settling into, you're just I, settling into the new one. So look, I wasn't there. lobbying for a job there. I was, <laughs> I was saying, you know, maybe reach out to our community because we have some brilliant that's people in there. Um, that's all. Let's see here. Okay, I like I like the salary question. We'll do that one. Uh, Oh, there's the PM at Spotify. Okay, I see, I see. Transition yeah. from bachelor's in psychology to master in HCI. That one could be a... Ah, we talk about that transition all the time. Um, 
<laughs> There's one here, but confused about an offer. Um, UX designers worked in a large B2C company for five years at an L4 role, whatever that means. Um, never had ownership or autonomy. Didn't seem to change until I changed my change process drastically, which I'm not too comfortable about doing. Uh, we'd love to switch and offer an L4 right below senior role that allowed business to business company. Looks good. We'll have ownership for autonomy, except we expect to be senior given my work experience also. Uh, just got promoted to senior. I'm wondering if it, if taking the position might affect my future job interviews. Basically, could it be a step down? Okay, that's not as good as I thought it was going to be. Yeah, that, that's just a that's just a straight almost politics role. Politics. Yeah. Role. Okay, here's here's an interesting one that I actually really like. Let me know your thoughts. Would you okay. request a user interview with a competitor? Oh, I saw that. Yes. Yes. No. Yeah. No. We should. Yeah. Definitely have that one. You want to talk that one? That one. Yeah. Yeah. That no, one's I, exciting I, to I, me. Let's do that. I one. thought that was quite. That was quite. Um, um, That's juicy. And, it is. It's juicy, cheeky and it's it's cool. Um, yes. I do it just for a laugh. Them strawberries look juicy. Uh, if anyone gets that reference, please drop it in chat because I I love that. Yeah, <laughs> me, so. I'll I'll give it a couple seconds for people to drop that in chat <laughs> uh, if if they if they are familiar, um, and then I'll explain because out of context it sounds rather uh, lewd. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we'll take the first three questions there. Yeah, and uh, I like that. Okay. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to comment with their... I'll delete, I'll delete last do... week's questions. Yes, do that. that Rather we yeah. mess them around last time. And these last two I'll put into the bank. Okay, so them so, strawberries look juicy is a uh, a reference to um, a bad lip reading uh, video from, oh, it must have been late 2000s or early 2010s. Uh, it was uh, Michael Buble's song, uh, Just Haven't Met You Yet. They, they um, dubbed it with russian unicorn okay. and um at one point it looks like michael buble is is mouthing the words them strawberries look juicy <laughs> and and they say them oh we lost somebody with that okay so <laughs> <laughs> oh dear we're losing uh, viewership all right <laughs> Change talk, change talk. <laughs> <laughs> them strawberries look juicy all right so that's that's that but it, just to finish that, is that available on YouTube, presumably? It is available um, on YouTube, yeah. And you know what? I, I don't think uh, there should be any copyright weirdness if I just show that part of it. So I'll cue it up, and we'll, we'll watch okay. it here. <laughs> um, and, and maybe even I can share some audio as well. We'll see. Uh, see oh, and while you do that, I've got, I've got something to show you as well. Oh, you do? Oh, yes. I was going to ask... Because I saw on Instagram that you had uh, made some updates. Is that fair to say? Yes. So if you if you look in my background, I've got the thing sorted out. So hopefully this will work. Look, it doesn't completely wash out the light. It's, it's just still kind a bit of. Bright. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I can actually turn that down a bit more. In a sec. Um, yeah. I wonder how low you can go with the voltage. Yeah. Well. Oh, that's no, oh, that went wrong. I didn't. Wow. There we go. Looks like it's exploding behind you. Yeah, that's about that's basically as those we, but you know we we because we talked about it and I was gonna take it all the wiring to bits and get a um, put in a resistor and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you can actually buy units to go in line for LED dim, um, LED dimming. So it, from Amazon. So next day um, it it appeared. I have got myself a nice little remote control and all that sort of stuff. Um, so it does dim it down a lot, but I think I'm going to go and get a manual resistor and you know a, a manual dimmer and do that. So you can actually turn it down quite low because this one is on a, on a remote control and it cost me about two pounds. And and so it, that the quality isn't exactly what you would expect, but it proved, but it kind of proved the concept quite cheaply. So 
Um, but it does work now. So I'm, I'm very happy with that. And I've got my first um, proper recording with that um, happening on Monday because um, I'm doing a, um, a podcast recording but using Restream. Um, oh, um, exciting. Um, that's going to be very exciting. So lots of new things happening on Monday. All right. Uh, here we go. Oh, wait. Sorry, give me a minute here. I don't think I shared audio on this, which um, is problematic for the thing that we're trying to illustrate here. <laughs> Share system audio. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill the audio, the, the music here for a second. I'm going to... Oh, oh, I accidentally killed Barry. Oh, no. Hang on. I'll bring him back. There he is. All right. Meant to do Close that. Up. <laughs> and then we'll we'll bring this up here. And uh okay. It says hey that's okay girl. So here I'm going to I'm going to play just the just the part I'm I'm referencing here and uh we'll turn this up so you can all hear it. Uh we'll j we'll actually just do back it up a little bit here. Uh and I'll do a quick audio check. Hey girl. You hear that okay? Yep, yep okay. Works, right? Great. All right. So we're going to sit. We're gonna, here's the strawberries look juicy. Damn strawberries look juicy. There you go. That's that's the reference. That's the reference. Here, here, All, right. here, here. <laughs> All that yeah. for that. For, so, it was worth um, it. It was wasn't worth it. Good. Okay, great. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad. So is uh, now every listener disappeared? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've lost them all. <laughs> Uh, okay right. Where let me at? just make sure that we are good on some of this stuff oh and I realized last week we didn't have that little logo in the bottom right hand corner there um, yeah, okay. and I'll, I'll try and do better not to waffle on so much so you can actually get it in under the hour this time so you don't have to <laughs> I said oh that. shoot I can't, I can't promise that let's see here You know what's embarrassing is I actually haven't read the article in like a couple of weeks here. So I should probably do that really quick. <laughs> it's been a busy day, everybody. I just like barely am getting by with the skin of my teeth here. Um, it's long hours in meetings, but that's, you know, that's how, how it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had that all week as well. It's been, it has been nonstop all week. And then I had the rather embarrassing moment of, doing a project management review and we're getting close to the end of this project that's been going on for about two years and, and oh yes we've got this work package and it's all fine and it's all internal so there's nothing happening and the client was like oh, I thought we said we were going to do an external customer workshop but no 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 we've done loads of them we're not doing any more of them oh but it says in the in the script I said no it doesn't so I pulled up the other uh, proposal and read, read it and said oh you're absolutely right we meant to be doing what is actually being built as one of the biggest workshops in the entire project so Oh, um, hey. so yes, I've, 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 after what has been quite a hectic project to try and keep it all on track, um, right at the last minute, I've had a bit of a curve. I mean, still fine. I've still got about two months to sort it out. So that's that's not a drama. But, you know, when you're just thinking, I've just got it all nailed. It's all it's all sorted out. Um, yeah, so that kind of set the tone for the rest of the week because I found this, I realized this on Monday morning. And, um, and then I, I feel like I've been playing catch up for the rest of the week. I feel um, you. Feel ya. Oh, okay. I th I think I'm okay. I'm I'm rereading the article, just glancing through and kind of refreshing my memory. This is the one where they used VR to kind of um, estimate whether or not their decision model uh, worked based yep. on uh, pedestrian interaction with autonomous vehicles. Right. That's that's the gist. Yes. I okay. think it's quite cool. Anyway, because anyway, this is in the UK, and they must have a big lab, and I want to go and see it. Ooh, it's really cool. Report so back. If, if you from... do, if you do go and see it, uh, you should be a field correspondent and um, maybe do some reporting. That's true. I'll tell you what, I did do this week, which was cool. We've got a few minutes before we go live. Anyway, um, I did go to another university. I went to Cardiff University, and they've got a new uh, human factors lab there. And I got the introductory show round by a robot. And oh. I could have talked to the robot, asked questions of the robot. 
and and it gave me the, the the grand tour which was amazing and then just after that robot finished i then got shown another robot um that was dancing for me and it was dancing the song uh, baby shark which was it by pedal or was it um you know on wheels no no the so the one uh, so the first one was was static but it was useful i'd like to see a kind of photo of them or whatever but the um the first one was sort of static but had fully articulated hands and expression face and all that sort of stuff then the second one was um was was um fully biped and and proper uh, proper movement wow the, which but it was only about sort of waist high um yeah. which was which was rather neat um but yeah so that that's that kind of made my was that wednesday was that thursday no today's thursday that was yesterday so yes um but then I didn't get home until because of our train system until very late. So that was partly my fault because we went to the pub afterwards. So. That's that's some good uh, for networking, of course, of course. Yeah, well, absolutely, yes. Just to uh, just to make sure everyone was happy with uh, yeah. what we were doing. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I uh, every conference that we go to, I, I'm always you know we're we're um, we we network uh, after every evening. Not every evening. I don't know. Maybe things have changed. I, I, I don't know. It's been a while since I've been to a conference in person. Um, I'd imagine that networking aspect is still, especially now, it's, uh, is quite important. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, you got to do, it, haven't you? It's uh, it's we just I oh, just miss it so much. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. we we talking about the um, the Ergonomics conference next year and, and different bits, and they're actually splitting it up to two and having the, uh, a virtual one and and a live one. And, oh, okay, um, so they're they're following the HFES model of doing a hybrid thing, yeah. Yeah, um, so it should be quite good fun. Um, but the the bits that we're doing around climate and stuff, we're doing that in the in the virtual bit. But I really want to go to the uh, go to the live bit, so that's going to be. That's all in April, so the start and the end of April, we, we can we'll be able to get some content, um, which will be exciting. <clears throat> what do we got? Five minutes before the show. Let's see here. Yep, I have something exciting for uh, one more thing. Cool. Um, fact i am getting the details now uh it, we're still working out details on it but it should be exciting i think um you know you're you're very plugged into the uh chartered institute stuff and mm -hmm. in the past you know us over here we've been pretty plugged into uh hfes it's been um it's been a while since we touched in touch base with our HFES friends, but uh, that might change soon. So cool. That's we exciting. might have. Yeah, there's a I, I have it in there. If you want to see if you if you want a little preview, I'm not going to spoil it here. OK, fair I, enough. I will say it for my one more oh, thing. I see. OK, yeah. So that'll be uh, a, a good fun, a good fun. I wonder whether we could do some sort of um mashup between the hfes and chf um so i kind of think that they they've done sort of it before no. have they yeah um, been, uh, are, are you talking like conferences or or like just collabs because they've done certainly done collabs yeah i know they've done collabs but i wonder whether we could do some sort of I don't know, some sort of joint interview type thing where we get um representatives from each in, into a into a room and um a virtual room or, or something. I don't, I don't know quite yeah. what the that would be, but um, Re yeah. uh, uh, joining hands across the pond, right? Something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, like we, we've had you know Claire Dickinson on the show before um, a couple of years ago when yeah. she was the. I don't know what the structure is. I forget. Um, uh, she, she was president. Yeah. Yes. Yes. When she was president, because she came out to HFES, and uh, we had her on the show. Um, and I, I know, I know they've, you know, Chris Reed was out there earlier this year, I think, for not out there physically, but attended the conference to talk about some stuff. So, yeah, I, yeah. I know they I know they reach out frequently. Yes. So um, but yes, it would be it'd be fun 
to do something like that, I think. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I mean, this whole virtual thing has been quite good because we had um, we had a paper presented in the Australian Economics Conference um, earlier this week, or was it late last week? It must be last week, um, which was quite cool because we just never would have gone and done that otherwise. Um, but uh, but with this, we could go and do it all virtually. Uh, Exciting. Quite... All right. We got a minute before the show. Is there any last, last minute things that we need to do before we go live? Uh, probably, but that's never really stopped pro- us. Yeah. yeah, you're probably right. There, there is <laughs> probably something. Um, okay. Treasurer no, says... Think- you're okay to do Patreon again this week and then do merch next week. So that's <laughs> oh, okay. well done. I should probably change the colors so that way I don't do. Ah, I'll, I'll remember it. You do if both. not, if not, they'll get mad at me. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, if you're hanging out with us, hang out for just one minute more. We'll be right back and we will start this show. I think. Maybe if I can get a handle on any of these buttons that are going on here, maybe then we can. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for human factors, psychology and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. We're recording this live on November 18th, 2021. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Mr. Barry Kirby. Hey, good morning. Good good morning to you. <laughs> nice and short this morning. <laughs> all right. Uh, we got a great show for you all tonight. We're going to be talking about how self-driving cars can consider pedestrian safety. And later, we're going to answer some questions from the community about uh, potential interviews for more management style roles, questions for senior folks who have me- recently moved to new companies or seeking sort of increases in salary. So we're going to answer that salary question. And how about interviewing a competitor? So we'll talk about all that. But first, some quick programming notes. Uh, hey, we have those Team C's Human Factors Minutes out there. Most recently, we did on climate ergonomics. Uh, Barry has provided some resources that we use to populate that Human Factors Minute. So go check that out. That's right in the feed if you're listening. Um, Human Factors Minute is also on Spotify and Patreon. So if you're interested in that type of format where we break down topics in one minute little chunks, you can um, help support the show by subscribing to those. Um, And I think the only other thing for programming notes that we'll mention is that next week here in the States uh, is Thanksgiving. So we'll be off next week. But we'll be back the following week, first week of December. I guess that'll be, what, the 2nd? December 2nd, we'll be back. Uh, But anyway, we know why you're here. You are here for Human Factors News, so let's get into it. That's right. This is the part of the show all about Human Factors News. Barry, what is the story this week? This week, we're talking about making self-driving cars more human-friendly. So automated vehicles could be made more pedestrian-friendly through the applying of neuroscientific theories of how the brain makes decisions to automated vehicle technology to improve safety and make them more human-friendly. Researchers have set out to determine whether a decision-making model could predict when pedestrians will cross the road in front of approaching cars, and whether it could be used in scenarios where the car gives way to the pedestrian, either with or without explicit signals. This prediction capability will allow autonomous vehicles to communicate more effectively with pedestrians in terms of its movements in traffic and any external signals, such as flashing lights to maximize vehicle flow and decrease uncertainty. The team used a virtual reality pedestrian simulator to analyze uh, trial participants in different road crossing scenarios. As predicted by their model, the researchers found that participants added up over time the sensory data from uh, vehicle distance, vehicle speed, acceleration, as well as communicative cues. 
This meant that their model could predict if and when pedestrians would be likely to begin crossing the road. So predicting pedestrian decisions and uncertainty can then be used to optimise when and how the vehicle should decelerate and signal to communicate that it's safe to cross, saving, saving time and effort for both. So, Nick, what do you make of that? So I, I'm a big VR nerd. I love the fact that they're using virtual reality to test this theory in a situation that could be potentially dangerous. This is um, something that I think we'll see a lot more of as virtual reality technology becomes more mature. It's already kind of there, and we can actually use it to test in some of these environments in which it is like potentially more dangerous, right? <laughs> you don't want them engaging in risky behaviors where they could get hit by a vehicle. And so I think this this makes sense from that perspective. I think this article just in general is a good springboard to kind of talk about some other things. And we've been using articles over the last couple of weeks to use as a springboard to, to jump into deeper discussion. And I'm excited to get there. But I want to know your thoughts. What are your general thoughts on this article? So when I first read the article, I was like, well, surely, and I think we've done a couple of articles like this before, where you sit there and go, well, don't we know this already? Isn't this already sort of there? Um, so it can, be seen, it can be seen as quite simple stuff, but it does show just how many almost basic gaps there are in our knowledge, that, or say knowledge that we just take for granted, that to develop AI um, in transport and in other domains, that we're going to have to do a lot more work in filling these holes with good, solid research. So I think it's really good that A, they've used, um, the, the, the using things like this to create a solid baseline for future development. But like you say, I, I really like the idea that they're using virtual reality to take people out of harm, but to be able to predict, uh, sorry, to be able to use that to gather data in risky situations. There is some thoughts there about, is there a difference between um, the data they gather there and what they will gather in real life? But short of putting people in front of dangerous situations, I think you're going to struggle to do that. And there, there has been a fair bit of work done to sort of prove that um, people, if they're using a VR uh, environment, that they will, you know, they'll act in the way that they would do in real life. So we use that in training quite a lot already. So it's, yeah, it, it, just the size of the simulator as well must be amazing. But yeah, as you say, let's talk about some of the, um, um, some of the main elements of, of what we could talk about. So where would you like to go first? Yeah, I think maybe we start with current state of self-driving autonomous vehicles and then maybe jump into sort of the human factors issues as it relates to pedestrians. And then we'll link that all back to the article. So, you know, let's let's start with sort of what's going on with self-driving cars now. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to mind for a lot of people is Tesla. Um, yeah. and, and do you want to talk a little bit about what what's going on at Tesla right now? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Tesla, I think, is pretty much recognized as the as probably the leader in the market in terms of they've got their um, self-guided vehicles, the the you know the, the self-drive vehicles, and in many ways that's what they're selling as. And uh, but they've really got that caveat of they're expecting the driver to sit there, hands almost poised around the steering wheel, ready to take control when it goes wrong. And they they you know te Tesla cars have had some accidents. Um, it's interesting that the that the 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 Tesla environment at the moment is very is pretty much like a like when there's an airline crash that as soon as it as soon as there is one crash then all the news articles all the Twitter and all the face social media goes mad because they're like oh they, they they've had an accident whereas actually the number of accidents they've had is very actually comparatively very small and a lot of them have been because when we're expecting um, drivers to, you know, be ready to take over, I think we're expecting them to be sat at least understanding what's going on. A lot of the accident, accidents have been where they've been maybe reading a book. In fact, there's been a couple where they've been sat in the back seat um, and then wondering why they've um, why they've crashed. And it is still new technology. There was a, um, a recent example where the um, Tesla is using like over the air updates, and and there is some caution around that about how that works, but. It is interesting when you sort of go back to sort of look at it and say, well, actually, we've had this levels of driver support for now for quite a while. You know, we've evolved from, you know, ma um, you know manual gears through to automatic, um, though we haven't quite fully made that progression in the UK. Um, cruise control, you know, parking support, and now you're into the lane assist and auto drive. So there is an evolution there. Um, but yeah, I think that's where them sort of bits are. Um, what do you think about the... Um, uh, so, so some of the other research, where, where, where do you think that's going? Yeah, I want to take a step back. So w when we talk about autonomous vehicles, I think 
a lot the general public's mind might go to Tesla uh, as the leader, and that's just because of how pervasive their technology is. Right, they're trying to push it. They're testing it in a, a, a way that may or may not be safe, and we'll talk about that. But I think everyone thinks Tesla because that's what's out there. That's what's available to people now. I do want to talk just a little bit about the domain to begin with, um, because I think there are some other really interesting things going on, right? So when you think about self-driving vehicles, I think most people, most companies um, kind of boil this down to two core statistics about success of, of autonomous vehicles, right? One is how many miles has this driven? And that's kind of acting as a way to measure how much data this each company has for training the AI to uh, sort of react to situations in the environment, right? And sort of also how much investment that company has put into self-driving cars on the road. The other metric or the other statistic that is looking, uh, that everyone's looking at is disengagement. So this is when the human operator actually intervenes and takes over because the computer, the AI, the system couldn't understand what was going on with a situation. And they look at this by every mile that was driven, right? So this is not a statistic that a lot of companies share because it's proprietary. It's kind of how they train their data. They'll make improvements based on those interactions. And so everyone's proprietary about that. But this does kind of uh, give us a sense of what people are looking at and what's going on. Now, I do want to take a, a, a step back even more. We mentioned Tesla. There are other companies that are doing this, right? So Google's sister company, Waymo, uh, they are widely considered the leader in terms of uh, self-driving technology with their testing piece, right? Because, I mean, Tesla's doing their stuff, but in terms of Waymo, they have 20 million miles, and this was as of last year, so it's probably even more now. Yeah. Most of those, not even in California, you know, they're they're looking at sort of um, 0 0.09 disengagements for every 1,000 miles. That's a pretty good ratio. Uh, you also have General Motors with Cruise, and that's they're at about half a million miles at and 0.19 disengagements per every thousand miles. So these are two companies kind of that are well ahead of everybody else in terms of miles driven, disengagements. Uh, that's with within the state of California though. That might be that might change, you know, as it goes from state to state. But this data here is actually only a limited snapshot of what's actually going on. Most experts actually consider them the leading uh, programs just in general. Anyway, I wanted to give that context for the field itself, because I think it's really interesting when we do kind of break it down and think, okay, yes, Tesla, they have this system out there and they're, they're, they're doing a lot of it based on like real world uh, feedback, right? I think, and that's, that's scary. And we can talk a little bit about safety. I don't know. Do you want to jump into the safety bit here? Yeah, I think it is because I, 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 you know, Tesla, as you say, are doing it, are doing it on the road. They're doing it there, and you know, there, there is a story out there of you know, didn't a self-driving car actually kill somebody? Um, so, is it worth diving into um, into that because you know, the, the, there's a lot of um, publicity issues around this, and you know, what are the uh, what are the intricacies around it. So, March 18 of 2018, um, that, that was the first time a self-driving car actually. Um, um, ran down a pedestrian and it was an uber car with a safety safety drive behind the wheels so it had all the uh, the elements there and but unfortunately hit and killed a um a 49 year old woman who was walking her bicycle across the seat in in arizona so that was basically we see that as a reminder that um self-driving car tech self-driving technology still has a way to go um but it's that's only um one, uh, you know, that's one fate. I think they we said that they produce one fatal accident every hundred million miles driven, and when we compare that to actual um, self, uh, you know, normally driven cars, so non-autonomous vehicles, um, it's it's still completely way off what your um, day-to-day -day metric is. So you know, if you're driving your car normally, you're at much 
greater risk of of having an accident than you are in a, in an autonomous vehicles in an autonomous vehicle so yeah i think there's still a um that there's a perception issue with this as as long with anything else but the systems are um uh, are updating all the time and as you quite rightly pointed out there's um there's a, a lot that's going on there's a lot that's being learned and um the 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 other half of the problem is um almost like that false positive as well so where they're taking corrective action where they where they didn't need to um but it, it's all get it's, it's all being pushed down that road of um learning as we go and you could argue should we be learning out on the um on the highway and shouldn't it should it all be done in a lab but that's again as, as we said that's not really not really the path that, that the likes of tesla is taking so there is also the, the there is issues at the moment, uh, particularly in the American side of things, where they they're trying to track and understand um, just where these accidents happen. So the NTSB is um, really trying to cover a lot of these accidents, and they're they're trying to work with the the the, the, the manufacturers to get the data underway. And they're, they're, they are having um, struggles with that with with different companies. Um, so I think that's you know there there are the the safety elements of this, but there is also a whole lot of, I guess, um, there's policy issues around um, a lot of this to play with, isn't there? So, do you want to sort of have a look at some of the those policy elements that um, that we need to be looking at? Yeah, the policy level, uh, the policy stuff is interesting because right now a lot of this is taking place at sort of the state level, and this is kind of the wild west as we are experimenting with autonomous technology, right? I think in terms of safety and laws surrounding autonomous vehicles, those here in the States, it's it varies by states. And so you might have some states with no legislation around it. And I think as as of 2000, there was 29 states with legislation legislation that had passed uh, with some sort of mandate on on autonomous vehicles. It looks like the two most friendly states to testing autonomous vehicles is California and Arizona. So you'll hear a lot of these stories about accidents that happened here. You just mentioned the woman that was killed in Tempe, Arizona. And then I think there's there was another crash that happened uh, in, oh, I forget where it was, but I think there was a Uber crash that happened in California. So you'll hear about these states because they are the most sort of friendly for uh, for, for uh, testing autonomous vehicles. Although I say friendly, but I think what actually might be happen happening here is that they are unfriendly to it, or they have passed so much legislation that confines and restricts the system that they want to test it under those conditions, because then they are dealing with potentially the the most strict guidelines that they'll experience and therefore can roll that out everywhere right and so i think what they're doing is kind of taking a uh, a conservative approach and testing it from you know as much restrictions as possible and hopefully that will help so again with policy here we're we're kind of the worry is that legislators don't understand what's going on and that interpretation of what's going on with the systems and with these companies is going to be uh is going to sort of delay implementation and that's why it's so crucial that we have somebody in <laughs> legislation to actually advocate for human factors and interacting with autonomous vehicles i think missy cummings was just uh uh what's the word i'm looking for assigned or um anyway i i think she was just nominated as some role in government. And I, I fail to remember because I didn't put it in the show notes. But I think something like that is helpful to have somebody who is intricately involved with human factors and understands autonomous systems and can act as a liaison for communicating that with lawmakers, legislators. And I'm talking from the state side, right? Ultimately, policy should shape whether or not self-driving cars are good or bad for the environment. We talked about climate ergonomics, mentioned it at the top of the show. We just did a human factors minute on it. Barry, you've you've brought up the uh, Chartered Institute of Human Fa- er, Ergonomics and Human Factors. Uh, they have that white paper on it. 
you gave a presentation on it. It's really important, right? And so as we're thinking about self-driving cars, you know, the social costs of carbon emissions and all that stuff is also very important to consider. Yeah. And then ultimately, the bottom line here is that transportation policy doesn't do much of anything uh, for the social cost of driving. And that's a problem that's going to get worse unless we actually do something about it. Yeah. That's a lot of information. We, we just covered so much there. I want to make sure that we have a chance to go <laughs> back and touch on anything if we missed anything. Is there anything that I said that you want to comment on? Um, not really. I think we, you like I said, we've covered a lot of information there, there really quickly over over that side a bit. Um, I think fundamentally for me, it is there is just still, it is such an exciting space in many ways that um, you know, that things are happening really quickly and updates are happening really quickly. We're learning so so much stuff really quickly, and it's going out there on the road, literally on the road straight away, and it's getting that balance, isn't it, between policy, safety, and and technology development. So. I think it is a case of watch your space, but let's try and try and do it as safely as we possibly can, but still keep a, a sensible pace of change. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's true of like many technologies that are emerging now that could kind of have ethical or even life threatening imp uh, implications, right? So thinking like AI, facial recognition, that type of thing, not yeah. so much deadly, but has ethical considerations. Technology is is really important and sort of we want to make sure that we advance at the right pace to make sure that we're matching legislation and that we're matching also uh the safety concerns with that stuff yeah no that, that that's that's absolutely right um i mean the the obviously the, the other big hitter with this we've we've talked a lot about the vehicles but actually what this article is talking about a lot is is pedestrians um so i mean the, the issue with pedestrians with this is fundamentally where does that relationship happen between people and vehicles so shall we have a um a skirt around the issues of of the human factors issues with pedestrians yeah let's talk about them there you know this one is not going to be as in-depth as the other section that we just talked about to give kind of the context of self-driving vehicles but i think there are a lot of issues with pedestrian crossings in general right there's think about sort of the human factors that goes into a person crossing a street. There's the markings on the ground that you look at. You know, is it two lines that indicate where you should cross? Is it a series of horizontal lines that indicate a space where it, it you know it has more visual weight to the driver? Or there are all these things that go into that, right? So then there's also the markings above the road. So how do you indicate to the system that you would like to cross? You press a button that says, I want to cross. And then it gives you a signal at the other end that says, theoretically, it is safe to cross. No car should hit you. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what do those signals look like? And then how do you make that accessible? How do you make sure that people who are vision impaired are able to cross these intersections? Well, then you add uh, auditory cues. You know, you said cross, cross, you know, and a countdown, 10, 9, 8 seven, six. You also have, you know, wait, if, if it's not safe to cross, wait, wait, wait. So then you have all this stuff that's going on. And this is just at a very high level here, right? And then you throw in autonomous vehicles to the mix, or even let's, let's not get to autonomous vehicles yet. You have other humans in two ton vehicles that oh, yeah. could potentially collide with you. And so then you have the human factors bits of well, how does a human read all these cues as well? Well, you have the red light that indicates to them to stop. Do not go or else you will hit somebody who's here. You also have how do you make pedestrian crossings in a way that is not blind to drivers traveling at speed so that way they can see you. And then also you have the interaction between cyclists and pedestrians and vehicles. And it just gets very complicated very quickly. These are all discussions about formal crossings. This is, in every sense of the word, the environment telling you it is okay to cross here. That doesn't even get into other things, like what happens if you cross in a place where you're not supposed to, which is why that woman in Arizona died, because that system was expecting to anticipate those types of interactions at a crossing where it is clearly marked, but she was crossing in a place where 
there were no markings. And so the car wasn't anticipating that. And how do you, it's just this massively unfortunate event that the system didn't understand. The driver wasn't paying attention and couldn't intervene in time. There's a lot going on. I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to let you talk for a little bit, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just want to dig that, dig into that bit about the uh, different environments a, a bit more as well, because you're right, all, all of these um, autonomous vehicles, it, it's a system, isn't it? So they rely on systems, a uh, system's understanding to to break down what they expect and when. And you could argue that actually in the center of towns and, well, in, in the center of cities in, in partic particularly, that's easier because you know you do have laws and regulations around it and you expect people to, to cross at the appropriate place. It's um, rare, except on movies, I've noticed that they always dive out in front of cars and across traffic and things. So as long as you're not in a movie, you're fine. Um, so you have the formal crossings, but the you've got different environments. So in towns and when we've been to the States in the past, um, you know, the there's lots of um, smaller suburb areas that don't have... Um, paths on them because they don't actually expect people to walk anywhere but if you're actually walking on the road um or something like that and the cars you know cars are not expecting you to be there how do they know that you're there how do they recognize that you're there when the you know the the edges or the um the the deline delineations of the road aren't as formal as they are in um in a built-up area so there's all them sort of bits and as you quite rightly say around uh, around cyclists we I rarely hear anything being talked about in the autonomous car space around cyclists. It's always pedestrians and um, and uh, sorry, pedestrians and cars. Um, cyclists are almost a, a law unto themselves, and so how do we interact with them when they don't? They act in probably um, a more unpredictable manner than, than quite a lot of a lot of other people because they're on the road, they're a participant user, um, but they're also probably much quicker and much nippier than um, than a pedestrian would be. So, I mean, an interesting piece of legislation that seems to be coming around at the moment, and I've got to give a bit of a hat tip to Professor Paul Salmon for pointing this one out, is that the, the, the legislation is coming about to have cyclists and pedestrians having some sort of beacon on them. So some sort, either a Bluetooth beacon or um, a wireless beacon or whatever on, the, on their person. So the um, auto, auto, autonomous car systems can recognize that they're there and it will be sort of a mandated... Um, idea and that type of thing which is great um really like the idea except for you know as, as a short-term fix i get that whilst the the systems aren't good enough to necessarily do all the recognition for all the use cases let's have a simple system in place to make it happen but my fear with that is is it just the short uh, the uh, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to um we forget about why we have why we put this put the system in place as a, as a short-term fix and then it becomes mandated about you have to wear it all the time. We, and then we forget about why we did it. Then suddenly somebody gets ran over um, or has an accident or something and they weren't wearing the um, the beacon. And suddenly it then becomes a victim's fault um, for not, you know, yeah. for not wearing it when actually, you know, we we take the foot off, literally the foot off the gas of the development for the cars. Um, there are some other issues as well. We, we mentioned... Um, about people um, with the auditory cues, so that EVs have already not making enough sound uh, to provide audio cues for deaf people to cross the road. Um, this article talks about um, you know the car um, automatically um, slowing and maybe flashing its lights because flashing lights in the UK is seen as an almost acceptable way of highlighting the fact I've seen you, please cross the road or whatever it is. Um, but if the EV slows down and flashes its lights well if you're blind you can't you um you can't see that it's um it's flashed its lights so you know we, we're not looking necessarily thinking about all of the um you know if you're deaf if you're blind what's the um um the the impact of of them um and then we again going back to the space issue there is this idea in the uk that's been pushed out quite a lot around shared spaces so the idea being that uh, they get rid of a lot of the road markings and um proper crossing uh, crossing areas and pedestrians and vehicles just have to mill around and and do their thing so the cars can drive slowly through pedestrians can just step out into the in, into the space they don't have to wait don't have to look they just walk and cars are expected to slow down and it, that's all based on psychology and then you're meant to if the pedestrian will make eye contact with the driver because the driver driver is driving slower 
in the theory that the driver then makes a, a human contact with that person, uh, with the pedestrian. So things, oh, actually, it's not just a pedestrian. It, that's somebody. I better not knock them over. So they slow down and, they, and it sort of negotiate. And there's places like Brighton and Lost where, where they've got that. If we've got these sort of systems in play, how is that going to work? You know, it, would the autonomous vehicle always have to be subservient to the um, to the people? So then shared spaces wouldn't work what they um wouldn't really work in that way because we would have to talk about what does priority really mean so right. you're right there is a lot to dig into with the human factors issues with pedestrians i think in some ways they're they're generally a little bit easier because fundamentally we're all about protecting people um we want to make sure people are safe and that's always pretty much going to be that standpoint um but there is a lot of i mean uh, the, if you're a human factors practitioner in this field i think that's where there's going to be a um, a lot of rich pickings isn't there oh yeah yeah, certainly have some uh, sort. I'm looking for some some job security in that sector. That's <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's let's uh, tie this back to the article, right? So I think that we're talking about here this basically a new model of decision making that they have come up with as a way to sort of understand or predict pedestrian behavior as they're crossing the road, and they're using it to test it for autonomous vehicle development. And once again, they're kind of using virtual reality as the method for the environment to test whether or not this is, in fact, safe, right? And to see if the model is working in the way that it's predicted and it does. We want to talk about some examples here just from the article so that way we can get through it. Yeah, so I mean, they, they had, um, in fact, they had a, a number of um, d different scenarios that they were using, um, but they all, um, they, they, like I said, they all use different um, behaviors of whether they flash the lights, whether they slow down and things like that. But fundamentally, in every single example they used, they used it to gather that data um, and, and their model, which they called, uh, well, they called it a drift diffusion decision making model. Now, when I talked about diff drift diffusion, I assumed we were going to be talking um, around some, uh, you know, some sort of uh, Fast and the Furious film. Um, because because they they like the whole drifting and things, don't they? But apparently not. But the um, yeah, all the examples that they use showed that actually this model works um, really well. So it clearly can know it's only going to go one way now. And if that can um, fulfill the, some then some that uh, fundamental knowledge for how um, AV um, autonomous vehicles act, then then it's clearly going to move forward. Yeah. Speaking of mo moving forward, you know, we can speculate on the future. I think it's pretty clear to see where where things are going. We still have a lot to learn. And like we mentioned, there's a lot in this space where you're not going to have uh, where, where you are going to have that job security. Right. I think some some key takeaways here is that as these pedestrians are making the decision to cross, they seem to be adding up a bunch of different information lots of evidence on whether or not the car is going to stop or hit them or anything like this. And and not only relating to the vehicle's distance or speed, but also using these visual cues from the vehicle and whether or not it's going to decelerate or flash its headlights or anything like that. So there, there's a lot of information that the the pedestrians are using to make informed decisions about crossing the road. And just quick non sequitur aside it took me like 30 years of my life to figure out the the punchline to the joke why did the chicken cross the road to get to the other side i didn't realize what that was until i was like 30 years old <laughs> the chicken just wanted to die i didn't understand <laughs> uh anything else that we want to bring up with this article autonomous vehicles or human factors issues anything like that oh i think we've we've done an awful lot this evening on this i think it is i think it's it's a subject we're going to come back to in different forms um <laughs> around the um autonomous vehicle thing as it throws up more and more different issues um but fundamentally if anybody from leeds is listening then i would love to come and see this um this vr simulator it's apparently the biggest vr simulator that does what it's uh, does what it does it's the largest pedestrian simulator um i don't know how much color is for pedestrian simulators um but it's it's clearly a, a, a big uh, big big bit of kit. So yeah, if anybody's listening, just hit me up. I'll I'll come and have a look at it, and take some photos. We could do you know do do some sort of live interview from there. That'd be brilliant. It always ends up being the shows that we uh, struggle with, and the show notes that end up being the best <laughs> episodes. 
All right. Well, I just want to thank our patrons this week for selecting a topic and a huge thank you to our friends over at Leeds University for our news story this week. If you want to follow along, you can join me on Office Hours. I do that every Monday where I find these news stories. We do post these links to the original articles and our weekly roundups on our blog. You can also join us on our Discord for more discussion on these stories if you'd like. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back to see what's going on in the Human Factors community right after this. Human Factors Cast brings you the best in Human Factors news, interviews, conference coverage, and overall fun conversations into each and every episode we produce. But we can't do it without you. The Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running the show come from our listeners. Our patrons are our priority, and we want to ensure we're giving back to you for supporting us. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like access to our weekly Q&As with the hosts, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Minute, a Patreon-only weekly podcast where the hosts break down unique, obscure, and interesting Human Factors topics in just one minute. Patreon rewards are always evolving, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you, and remember, it depends. Yes, huge thank you as always to our patrons uh, for picking out these news stories. And we especially want to thank our honorary Human Factors cast staff patron, Michelle Tripp. Patrons like you keep the show running. Thank you all so much for your continued support. Uh, Speaking of patrons, um, I I understand that some of you have been asking where Blake has been. Uh, Blake is still around, and he's actually in YouTube chat right now. He says, great show, gents. Uh, and if you want to hear more from Blake, you can always become a patron. And we do have Human Factors Minute. He is still uh, working on those Human Factors Minutes. So if you want to hear more from Blake, you can join us over there. He will be back. He will be back. Um, but yes, I, I've been told. If, if, if I let him back. I'm, this is quite, this is quite comfy now. <laughs> if Barry will let him back in. Hey, there's there's enough room for, for three people or more people on the show. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I do want to mention Human Factors Minute. It's something that we put together on a weekly basis. We are uh, always coming up with new, interesting, exciting topics for you all. If you are a subscriber to our audio version, you have likely heard Human Factors Minute in your feed now with the Team C's effort that we have going on. Uh, There's more like that on on Patreon, and uh, we're on Spotify now, too. I guess our treasurer says to plug Spotify at some point. So we're there. It's a paid thing you can do. Uh, it helps support the show and really just uh, helps us pay for things like this fancy restream thing that we're on or the web hosting fees or anything like that. Anyway, enough plugging. Thank you, Treasurer, for the kind words. Uh, it's time that we get into this next part of the show we like to call. It came from. It came from- Yes, it came from. This week is all about uh, Reddit, and we got some really fun ones this week. This is where we search all over the internet to bring you topics that the community is talking about. If you find any of these answers useful, give us a like wherever you're at to help other people find this content. We have three questions tonight. Let's get to this first one here. This one is, I have an interview for a PM role, focused design systems at a certain company. Any tips? Uh, they go on to write, I know this is a design sub, but any designers who move to a PM role, I have about three years experience working as a hybrid PM slash designer. This year, I find it difficult to find a PM role, which was more focused on design since most PMs were generic or technical. I want to get into this and and really use this question as a springboard to talk about the transition from a worker B role to a more management position uh, and and really from like the human factors perspective or the researcher perspective or anything like that. Barry, I want to get your thoughts on this. Have you transitioned to a more managerial position? And what was that transition like? Do you recommend it? Um, well, I would. Um, absolutely. So, yes, I've come all the way from um, be to work, be on the floor. Now I run my own company. And some would say I even attempt to run my own projects. Um, and I think it's one of these things that, it's some people get really scared of it. And I think, you know, quite rightly so, because I think it's not 
it's not a skill that you know you just pick up it is you know everybody sees that you go you transition to the project management role or the management role it doesn't just have to be project management um and think it's a natural transition for some people it's just not um you know it's it, it's a skill in its own right so you do have to put time and effort into it but what i would say from certainly from a, a human factors and or any sort of discipline that's, that's within our sort of realm is I think we make really good project managers and um, or managers in general because we take that human centered approach with us and and it really that that's when we become really really evangelical because right now you know we as human factors practitioners we're expected to talk about human factors it's what we do it's what we love but when you then go into more um generic human uh, generic management or leadership roles that are maybe not directly associated with with human factors you can still tell the story you can still um, fly the flag and that's where i think actually we've become really really effective i've seen some really great people move out of the human factors domain they've gone in to do different things almost new things but they take that human factors approach with them and it just i think it, it just works really well um what about you Nick? what what have you got experience of moving into that project management domain and and sh taking off the uh, or, or putting on the mantle of uh, senior management so i've certainly kind of uh, stepped into the management role, and it's interest. It's an interesting transition because now instead of focusing on the worker bee tasks, right, you, the stuff that you've been trained for in school or uh, previous industry work, right now you're sort of managing people, and I think we can link it back to that conversation we had last week about what makes in or was it last week or two weeks ago about innovation. Yeah. What what does ultimately make innovation possible is that facilitation piece, right? And I think it's absolutely true when it comes to managerial positions as well. You as a manager are a facilitator of a group of people that need to work well together. You're sort of making sure that those relationships are sound between people. You're also making sure that the end user is being considered in every step of the process. If you are stepping into a more project management role or a role that is sort of not so much human factors, but human factors adjacent. It is an interesting step because you're absolutely right. You can tell that story. You can make sure that um, everybody involved is keeping the end user in mind and you can start to, I guess, permeate, you know, the human factors thought process into everything else that's going on, at least in, in that area that you are managing. And so I think ultimately it, it it's a good decision for companies to hire people that have been in human factors roles in the past into those management positions. Uh, it, it's, um, it's not for everybody. I, mm -hmm. I will say that, right? I think some people really do find joy in, I call it busy work. It is busy work, but it's also highly rewarding work when you can see things that you have designed, when you have developed the relationships that you have made with other people on your team, with developers, with designers, to see something go from start to finish that you've had your hand in, that maybe you feel a little bit more invested in, I think that is meaningful to a lot of people. And so if you don't want to go into the management position, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different things work for different people, and it's a consideration. Anyway, that's that's my two cents on it. Sounds why, good to me. Yeah, why don't we get into this next one here? This is a question for senior designers. I'm going to extend that to researchers, human factors practitioners, who have recently moved to a new company. Are you seeing upticks in salary due to a hot job market? This is by, oh, shoot, I didn't mention the, who the other one was by. That one was by uh, Zacharia20199 on the user experience subreddit. This one that we're talking about now is from Chris Hansen AMA on the user experience subreddit. Uh, <laughs> I love that name. So they go on to write, all I hear about nowadays is the hot job market and how people are able to demand higher and higher salaries because demand is so high for a ton of jobs across a lot of industries. Are folks seeing this in product design industry, human factors industry, research industry? Can we demand higher salaries than we could have a couple of years ago? Barry, let's have the salary conversation. Yeah. I, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we've just been in that um, in that space at the moment. We've, we've just taken on um, some new people. Um, in fact, we've taken on, what, three new people this year. And 
absolutely right. I think um, in in certainly in the UK, that it is a hot job market. There is a ton of jobs out there. there um, people are desperate for human factors practitioners, be that on contract or salaried or, or whatever. Do we think that di- directly go- says that we can start demanding higher salaries? I'm not that convinced it is, actually. I think there is definitely, um, it is definitely uh, an employee's market. I think the the ability to challenge and, and ask for more is is definitely there. Um, and certainly with my experience that, that people um, are willing to do so, which I think is absolutely a good thing. And I think you should absolutely do that. Um, one of the things I got told when I was quite, um, when I was first starting the job in the civilian job market is always reject the first offer. Um, I don't know whether that holds true across everybody, but certainly um, I always did. Um, and it seemed to work, you know, not in an offensive way or anything like that, but, um, but there is always a discussion to be had. So there is that. The, is it going to, I think there is a level of, yeah, you can ask for probably a bit more, but not loads more. I don't, I think there is, no matter what job you do, there is a, um, companies still have to make a turnover and, and a profit. And, and that is still largely capped and more so with the, um, with the pandemic having gone on, then, you know, there isn't as much, in some areas that there's, there's money floating around in others, it just definitely isn't. Um, so hospitality, you know, is, where people were doing um, jobs in them sort of fields, they're just not there anymore. They're, they're starting to come back slowly, but they're, um, people aren't willing to sort of um, they, you know do much until, until that becomes a lot more stable. So I think there is, that's a very long way around me going. I think there is an, an opportunity to ask for some salary, but it's there's not you going, there's not the ability for you to go there and ask for ridiculous amounts of money because fundamentally the the um, the the maths or the economics still remain the same that there is a maximum amount of, of money in the pot to be uh, to be you know dished out between the uh, the entire company. What about from your perspective? Do you see any any changes or um, and are you are you able to ask for more ca- more cash in the US? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question because I don't necessarily think the question here is about what the salary is. It's about how do I know what my worth is? Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm reading it. And I think that's a really important question, right? Somebody who's just out of college, uh, you know, just got their human factors degree may not know how much they're worth. Uh, And that is an important thing to know because you could get lowballed. Somebody could hire you for something, you know, that is completely lowballing compared to your cohort, right? And so my advice for this is normalize talking about salary. Understand what people who have similar skill sets to you are are making because then you have that negotiation piece at the table. And if you are approached by a company with an offer that is not within that range, then you can come back and say, I was actually hoping for something more like this based on my own research. This is kind of what I was expecting. And it gives you as a potential prospective employee, the tools to negotiate that salary. Now, obviously there's a lot that goes into whether or not to accept a job offer, the benefits, the bonuses, the base salary is certainly kind of the biggest factor but you know the the happiness that you would experience on the job is also part of it how you would work with the team these are all factors that play into it but in terms of the salary perspective you know you can certainly try to normalize talking about it with other people and you know in fact that's that's something that I've started doing and as you get into positions you can start offering up your salary and saying look this is how much i make I think you should make the same amount. Start normalize, talk, normalizing talking about it because I was in a situation where I was grossly underpaid and I didn't realize it until I started talking about it with others. And so now I always offer that information out there first to make others feel comfortable about sharing theirs with me so I can say, look, here's how much I make. How much do you make? Let's compare notes. Is this right? And then again, it's just more bargaining power that you have to bring to the table later. Okay. Anything else with salary? Only one more thing, just to, on the back of what you, what you just said. Some companies do try and push a culture of um, that you shouldn't disclose what your salary is. 
Um, and I wouldn't be bullied into going down that approach whatsoever. What you talk about in the pub outside of work is entirely up to you. Um, companies cannot, um, you know, and force you um, to do that to do that sort of thing. So, and um, the fact that if anybody has in has that in their T's and C's, you should really that should be a bit of a not necessarily a red flag, but a bit of a, a warning beacon as to why would they need to do that in the first place. It's so. actually against the law in the United States to require employees to not talk about it. So, fun fact. All right, let's. Uh, we got one more here. Uh, let's get into it. This last one here is: Would you request a user interview with a competitor? This is by anonymous geographer on the user experience subreddit. I'm working on a project, and a marketing person on my team wants me to reach out to a person who works at the company who is our direct competitor. He said, we can be transparent about why we want to talk to our direct competitor, but also protect our product information. Honestly, I don't think the interview will be that useful, so I'd rather spend my time trying to get interviews with other people. He's pushing hard to get me to try to get this interview, so it's making me think that it might be a good idea. Am I missing something? I've never conducted an interview with a direct competitor to a product I'm designing, so I'm at a bit of a loss here. What do you all think? Barry, have you ever interviewed a competitor? Um, I've not interviewed a competitor directly like this, but I have done it in a way that I've let the competition know. I've let the competitor know through a, a through a conversation that this that a product has been developed. And when I read this, I thought this is the marketing person trying to get into the head of the competition, of letting them think that the you're developing something that maybe um, that that they don't know that you've got or basically just getting the competition worried, um, which may or may not be a good idea. Obviously, it depends on the product, depends on on your maturity, uh, or sort of product maturity and things like that. So it could be going down that route. It could also be looking about, you know, would that direct competitor give up some, um, some little gems about their product that, um, you know, when you sort of turn around and say, well, you know, have you used this product? Well, we've got our product and ours does X, Y, Z, which um, if they see that as big hitters, then, you know, you could take that as, um, as um, I guess, material to then then include into your own product. So I think it's been, the way I read it is it, it is being used as a, as, a, as a method for either trying to not steal ideas, but try and get ideas from the opposition or just to try and get under their skin um in terms of we're producing a cool product and we subtly letting you know about it um i think if that is the case then the marketing person has a bit of responsibility to you to tell you that's why that's happening um because i can't i cannot honestly see why you would go and ask the direct competitor for really for truly useful as as a as a ux research project um and then, tr then also trust the information that they're giving you. Fundamentally, I, I just don't think you'd do that. Or am I being naive, Nick? Do you think you do you think you would do that? No, I wouldn't do that. In fact, I would push back to the marketing person and say, "No, let's not let them know what we're doing." Uh, or it, here's here's a better approach. You ready for the better approach? Why don't you interview users that are using that product and ask them questions? Because that is ultimately the user base that as a marketer you are trying to reach is it not because <laughs> as a competitor you want to steal those uh people that are using the other product and so if they can identify gaps in that other software that is a opportunity for you and your company to sort of patch those gaps into your product i think that is probably the best way to go and i don't really have much else to say to that other than don't don't engage with a competitor because it gets tricky, especially with copyright and patenting laws here in the States. It gets tricky. Just avoid it entirely. Talk to users instead. That's yeah. that's what your role is. And so if you can recruit them somehow, that's another tricky bit, but that's a conversation for another time. If you can recruit them, then uh, I think you can certainly get some insights into that product. All right, let's switch gears here and get to this last part of the show. We like to call one more thing. Needs no introduction. Uh, Barry, what is your one more thing this week? So last week I posed the question, should I be upgrading to Windows 11? Um, the answer to that question is still no. It's still waiting. And <laughs> I haven't got to that point yet where I've said, yes, let's just do it. Let's move on. Though I have read up a few more things now, and apparently it isn't as bad as I think it's going to be. But my one more thing this week is still to do with Microsoft. I opened up my, uh, my Outlook this morning. I thought it was broken. 
Um, you know when you might do something and you might have inadvertently pressed some keys and it'll put it into a, di it'll put the, maybe change the style of it without you realizing um, maybe the window format and stuff like that. Yeah. I thought that's what had happened because it just didn't look right. The head, the the um, title bar and is wrong and the menu is a bit floating and stuff. Like that. It turns out that it updated overnight without me knowing about it. Um, and it's done it, but when I opened up Word, that's when it popped up with the, we've updated, look at our new things. But it didn't do it on Outlook, which is the first thing I look at in the morning. Um, and so I, I did spend a good couple of minutes just going, what have I broken? How have I done this? Um, what do I need to do about it? And then it, was, it wasn't until I opened Word that I was like, oh, actually, you know, we've gone through a fairly common update all the way through. Um, so firstly, it was the onboarding experience of this, of this new piece that really annoyed me. Um, and secondly, I just don't think it looks very good. So if anybody from Microsoft is listening, can you just have a look at the where you've got the title bar and the search bar element at the top of that? It looks a bit naff. I think you could do better. Um, it looks like it just feels like you've got a lot of wasted space up at the top of that. Um, so that is free UX uh, design information for, for Microsoft there as a value add because um, I think you need to change it fairly quickly. That was um, some fighting words. So, <laughs> yeah, there we go. But it's meant to be yeah. helpful. I mean, if you don't give them constructive feedback, they won't change anything, will they? You know, Anyways, I totally so that, 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 be done. <laughs> I, I totally, I totally feel the uh, everything's changed on me because of I think a key press. You know, like my son will come up to the keyboard and just start slamming buttons occasionally, and I'll be like, "What did you do? I did, there's something. What happened?" Uh, yeah. Anyway, my one more thing this week is, uh, hey, HFES is going to be hosting uh, the president fireside chats or town halls soon, uh, and yours truly is going to be hosting those. So. Ooh. The first one will be on Friday, December 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. We'll get more details to you out there soon, shortly. This is kind of late breaking. Today is when we finalize the day. So I just wanted to get that out there for everyone to listen. Put it on your calendar. If you're interested in what's going on in HFES, uh, write down your questions and come to that event. It'll be a great time to sit down with Chris Reed and uh, just talk about the state of everything. This is kind of a cool opportunity to uh, have one of those town halls. So. Again, we'll be pushing out more details about that soon. That's really it. That's all I had this week. So that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you like this episode, we invite you to check out episode 183. We actually took a look at the state of Tesla, Waymo, and other autonomous vehicles. Great companion piece to this week. Uh, comment wherever you're listening with what you think of the story this week for more in-depth discussion. You can always join us on our Discord community. You can visit our official website, sign up for our newsletter, stay up to date with all the latest Human Factors news. If you like what you hear, you want to support the show, there's a couple things you can do. One, leave us a re five-star review. Do that wherever you're at. Uh, that always helps the show, helps other people see that, yes, this is a trusted podcast and that it is good stuff. Uh, we hope it's good stuff. If you're here listening, then I hope so. Uh, two, if you're here listening, tell your friends about us because you must like the show, surely, if you're listening to the outro because <laughs> most people just skip the outro. So I'm going to just tell your friends about us. Three, if you're still here, and really want to support the show, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are two patrons away from being completely self-sustainable, so that's always nice. There's so always links to all of our socials and our website are in the description of this episode. I want to thank Mr. Barry Kirby for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about getting hit by autonomous vehicles? I'm on Twitter at Baz K. You can also find me on fa on Facebook and Instagram and all that sort of stuff. But you can also find me on Twelve or Two, the Human Factors Podcast, which is at www1202 podcastcom Huge thank you to Blake Arnsdorf for hanging out in the chat tonight. And as for me, I've been your host Nick Rome. You can find me streaming on Twitch every Monday for office hours and across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. depends. And if you're hanging out with us, stick around. We have just a couple minutes. I think we're gonna actually no, we're we're doing a full post show tonight because we have um we have a little thing we'd like to work on. We've got work to do. <laughs> we do have work to do. So uh typically towards the end of the year, we like to do a sort of recap of the news stories that we may have missed. And especially since, oh, excuse me, especially since we switched to the model of having our patrons choose the news this year, uh, there are plenty of news stories that we can catch up on. Some of them are one-liners, some of them are more in-depth discussion, but 
uh, I think the goal for tonight is to take a look at those and um, at least organize them in a way that we can do a show on it for uh, for the end of the year, you know, pushing that stuff out. This basically means that we can do shows and um, have Christmas off. Is what exactly. Saying. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that yeah. is <laughs> that is show. the goal. Uh, the goal here, I guess, is to pr- to produce the notes for the show that will air on the twenty third, uh, because twenty uh, third and the thirtieth, we'll do a two parter. I think. Cool. Um, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, so we- that, sorry, you know, I was talking about that um, in the pre-show. I was talking about the robot that I was messing around with at Cardiff. Yeah. It's called Pepper. Pepper. Um, yeah. Um, first, as in the pig. World, yeah. Well, no, P E P P E R. Oh, Pepper. Um, so, for, it, produced by SoftBank Robotics. But it's a world's first social humanoid robot able to recognize faces and basic human emotions. Um, and it costs about £15,000, apparently. Um, oh. So, mm-hmm. I'm what? looking at this because I fancy one for my office because it looks I- cool. I could have swore we talked about Pepper on the show before. Hang on, let me let me do a quick search. Uh, if you are if you are listening along, I guess our patrons are listening. Um, and if you're watching along, let me do a quick search here for Pepper because I Pepper. I am pretty sure we actually did a show on Pepper. Uh, robot, maybe. Oh, geez, I know, I know, we talked about it. Uh, is Pepper describe to me what Pepper looks like? So Pepper is um, probably about I don't know waist height, just over waist height, but on the on the base is kind of a, a solid base. Um, but it looks like it's got you know it almost like a, a single leg coming up. So it looks like it's got a trunk of a body um, with arms that move and all that sort of stuff. Um, um, white with eyes, mouth, and ears that sort of come out. I, I'll take because I can't share a screen here, can I? Um, oh, what I can do actually is if in the top of the show notes, yeah, I've dropped a link, and you can you can see. Oh yes, we have talked about Pepper. Okay, yes, I I, I don't remember what episode we've certainly talked about Pepper before. Well, I've met Pepper. Pepper's oh, awesome. Oh my goodness! Wow, you've you met a celebrity. Uh, yeah. Um, and and they introduced and this pepper was actually called dawn which is confusing um but yeah pepper gave me the the, the tour that i had and, and was quite amazing so i'm now looking about how much it costs for me to actually buy one because i think I'm, i need one in my life I, I can't afford one in Jeez. my life but i'm pretty sure i could um i i think i think pepper's being used in the medical field and i i wish quite possibly I, yeah i wish i could remember what episode this was uh, let's see here. Wearable. Tech. Oh, and it's the same one. So you know, I talked about the dancing robot. Well, that's in the same produced by the same people because that's I think uh, that's Neo, um, Neo Six, um, which is also by the same people, and it was dancing and everything, which was quite cool. No, they, they were they, the university must have had some sort of deal with these guys. I think I, mean, I think I need to have a chat with them. Jeez, I don't. I know we've talked about Pepper, and it's driving me nuts that I can't remember <laughs> what. I was going to say you. you it, I'm distracted you from what it is that you were. Um... No, that's okay. This is more important. I can't. <laughs> I can't get by it. <laughs> it's just. Uh... Nope, that's not it. Dang, I can't remember. I know we've talked about Pepper. I like looked up Pepper, and uh, I can't find it in any of our show notes. This is one of the benefits to transcriptions and attaching those transcriptions to your uh, show because that's, yeah. Um, Would it be pieces. if you look at the other link I found up there, which is around Neo, or I presume it's pronounced Neo? It might have been that that you did, which it looks similar, but is is fully articulated feet. Hmm. Um, but is is smaller, um, and that was the one that um, that they had dancing. Um, and again, I quite fancy that. 
You know what? Hang on. I got to I jeez. Ah, ABB was it? 2 hours ago. No. I wish it had to have been many many months ago and I don't Oh man. All right. Well, that's going to bug me. Thank <laughs> Sorry, you for yeah. that. <laughs> no worries. All right. So we are we're looking at um <laughs> I think what we just do is talk while we do this. Maybe you work from the bottom yeah. up and I work from the top down. I think what we'll do here, Barry, if you're on, you know what? I didn't actually share it with you. No, I, because, need, uh, I don't, I, I'm, I'm stingy about sharing here. So I'm going <laughs> to share the link actually on the top of our current show notes. So that yeah. way you have them. Um, yeah, there you go. That's the link to the document that we are working off of. Uh, so if you are under Human Factors News, um, this is what I'm thinking. As soon as I see you show up, I will, I will do it. That's uh, better. I would press the wrong thing. Recap. Cool. Okay. Oh, I see what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Here you are. So I think uh, what we do here is see where it says, like, some of them are just links and some of them have more than links. So yeah. what I'd like to do is... Um, uh, and some of them have multiple links. So, like, in this case, what I'll do is I'll uh, hit that, and you can see that all this stuff is uh, related to um, that first link under my name, right? But the one above is just a one-off. So I think what we're doing here is um, just indenting. Yeah, if, okay. If it can be. Uh, this looks like it's struggling over here. Uh, and, and again, this is like, oh, shoot, not even that. Oh, man, I'm just messing this up. This is why I need help. Uh, so <laughs> there you go. So that's that's what it should yeah. look like, right? So bullet cool. point you... uh, and yeah. title and date underneath it. Actually, you know what? Maybe even clean it up because I think this is actually a hyperlink, right? So um, yeah, yeah, we could maybe, make it work. Maybe just do that, right? Or, or maybe even keep the blurb. Keep the little blurb there so it looks like this. At least if so we nest it all to be, begin with, then we can make it all work, can't we? And then, yeah. yeah How about that? Of like, yeah. Sort of stuff. I think that's right. what it ultimately looks like. If there is a blurb, then take it, because not all of them will. But I think that also kind of has a, a implication. So if you want to start at the bottom and work your way up, I'll start at the top sure. and work my way down. We'll meet in the middle and uh, high five when we're there. Excellent. That sounds very, very American. Yes. Uh, we're very big on the high fives here. I think uh, there's um, there's high five culture. And why not? And why not? Oh, right. You know what? We should have. <laughs> shoot. I'm looking here. This is an article from, um, I guess we talked about. Oh, keep keep the dates, by the way, if you can. Uh, in, in between. You know where it says? Yeah, that? I can't. Yeah, if you can. Uh, sometimes they're finicky, but I think that'll help with uh, contextualizing when the month uh, these were in. Maybe we can just... It's not working, but you need to let me be editor of that. I've just sent you a request. Oh. I was hey. trying to work out why he wasn't doing anything, and I don't have any yeah. access. You don't have access. Uh, shoot. Oh, you know why? Hey, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Ah. Uh, change edit here let me um go back to the original or i guess uh yeah go back go back to the original show notes and, and i'm gonna update link. that link and now it should be should be able to edit with that new one cool so actually here's what we'll do so for each month we'll just write at the top, kind of uh, a bolded, centered uh, month. And that way, we at least just yeah, know what up. month it's from. Yeah? Cool. Like that. Yeah. And that way, we can delete everything else in the middle. So, yeah, this will be, be a fun one. I think this is annoying because we didn't start doing the recaps until mid-year. But I think, you know, for every year, 
on, it's going to be uh, really super easy to get all this information. Yeah. Um, which is kind of the point. Well, now you know what you want to do with it, then it's going to work, isn't it? So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, here, I'm just going to drag down this thing to like... So if I do January and February and you do March and April, I think that might work. Although... I think towards yeah, the end of March. April, yeah. Here, I'll just April's start there. April, there's only one story in April. <laughs> oh, okay. So if you start at March, then I'll just yeah. bullet point everything up through February. So that way we can just edit. All right. Uh, well, us talking about show notes isn't very interesting, but we can certainly talk about other topics while we're doing this. Uh, but, but can we, though? We, we Men and men can't multitask. I thought that was a proven like, fact. Oh, was it? I don't know. It's, it's well, something that we know, but needs to be scientifically tested. Is that right? Is that that's true. Know? Well, I think quite possibly. <laughs> um, oh, there's my the start to march. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm hesitant to like talk about any of the stories that we're massaging right now because uh, I want to save it for... Yeah. Talk about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, um, but if you see any stories that you're particularly interested in and want to talk about, highlight them as you're going through. Uh, you can highlight them in like a blue and I'll do like a green for me. And that way uh, we'll know who did what. And if it's both of us, then I'll think of something else like a, I don't know, a, a, a turquoise. A blue green seafoam. I don't know. Show tonight was pretty great. I, I, uh, it's always surprising to me the, the the shows in which we sort of do not necessarily a lack of prepared <laughs> content, but like that we, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of uh, up against the line. Flying by the, flying by the seat of our pants. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. They usually turn out pretty great. Um, so what I'm telling you is that we should probably be coming into these unprepared. Uh... <laughs> uh, maybe. <No. laughs> um, I think there's. A, I mean, the reason element of that isn't that that makes them really um, um, spontaneous and and that type of thing, which is good. But then the research elements. Not so much this week, but I know that there was last week, I think I, I sort of, um, said in the post-show last week that there was an element um, that I completely had a brain freeze. And he's sitting there going, uh -huh. um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Like, there are certainly episodes where I'm just like, I don't know enough about this. We need notes. This one, thankfully, I know enough about the domain to have made some interesting points. I think that's something that I, I think a lot of people that listen to the show like is that we're coming to this from a generalist perspective. Yeah. And that uh, we're not experts in these topics. Kind of fun well, to have those experts, right? But like just talking about them from that, we're your buddies and we're just going to talk about this cool topic that, you know. That's overrated. And I, you know, that's just. You say experts are overrated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Uh, now, the real trick to this list, too, is going to be cross referencing it with what we talked about on the show. I think I can understand it at a, um, at a glance whether or not we've talked about something on the show or not. I'd hope so. Uh, as the producer, <laughs> well, I'll leave that entirely in, in, in your control. Um, Thank you. Yeah, editorial. Yeah, you're welcome. It'll be easier when we have the uh, the the, re the blog recaps because then uh, I will know if it's a top story. It will have certainly, um, or actually, the recaps will have what we're talking, what we've talked about on the show, because the monthly recaps anyway. And then that those those are automatically excluded, so it's even easier. See, look how easy I've made it on myself post post uh, April. It's insane. This is this is a the, the fun part of planning content uh, for anyone who wants to become a content creator. Um, there's a lot that goes into it that I don't think is appreciated. 
uh, or or not not appreciated, but but recognized. I think. I don't know. You're a content creator. What what types of things go into uh, show prep and everything on your end? Like, what do what do you um, do for a typical? Probably not enough. Some people would say. Um, I think for because I do, I guess, a lot of that interviews approach um, and all that sort of stuff. It's around trying to trying to give the interviewees enough feeling that they are going to be looked after that they there's not going to be no shocks and surprises um but also you know give them enough of a heads up about what sort of things to expect but without taking away from the ability to you know ask interesting or difficult questions you know that type of thing um and so i do try and do a bit of a a bit of a plan I, i i tend to try and work out sort of like maybe um a structure of sort of five questions or something you know because we we try and do no more than um you know between 30 minutes and an hour um that type of thing so try to pitch that about right because i often find the ones that you expect to be really interesting and or a, a less so shall we say you you the, there was um one big one that i i i just felt was a not a it wasn't a disappointment but it was not what i expected it to be um okay. which was um it was just it was just weird um so i mean i guess you know we're in post show we're all friends here um so i did an interview okay. with uh with nasa which was amazing right so nasa sent me an email saying and well i pestered them a bit i think it's fair to say um said i'd love to do an interview love to do an interview and um they were like yep yeah, no we, we we could do that we could um at which point I was like, wow, I'm going to do an interview with NASA. That's going to be amazing. I was literally bouncing around the house, um, much to the amusement of my children. Um, the So I came to do the interview and I had they, they put up three people for me to interview. And I was thinking, Craig, for one person, it takes me 45 minutes. That's going to be like, you know. 15 it, minutes. But yeah, it was it was sort of like that. And I was like, oh, it's going to be amazing. The whole interview took just over half an hour. Oh, um, it just—I mean, it, it's it's still a—you know—you listen to the interview and it's it's still um, it's an interesting interview. Uh, they tell us a lot of stuff around um, the, uh, the the next projects, the, the stuff to Mars and all that sort of stuff. Really, really good. But you know, when you was—I think I, was, I sort of was hoping and expecting for something maybe like a couple of hours long type thing, um, and it kind of just wasn't. And I was like. I didn't know how to feel afterwards, so that that was a, an interesting experience. But the again, that was still in, in very much my learning. Well, I said I was in my learning phase. I still am in my learning phase. Um, it's about trying to. I mean, the, again, you you've given me some new um, new curveballs with using you know the 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 visual side of things. Um, so I'm now trying to play with that and see you know how does that how is that going to work? How's going to that going to fit into right. my content and um, what does that mean differently? Um, because you know, we I think some people are happy f- to to work with me um, on on an audio basis, but would they feel comfortable doing the uh, the, the video side? Yeah. So I'm do you know you've done a video with me, but then I think given that you told me how to do it, I thought I thought it was only fair. Um, I've got I'm interviewing two people on Monday that um, that they're going to come on video and they'll be the first I guess unsuspecting victims of the, um, well, the, of, so- the, of the video environment. So here's here's what I would so fortunately I haven't run into a situation where a guest of the show did not want to be on video format since we've gone back to it. Uh, but what I, I do have a backup plan in case that ever does happen, uh, mm-hmm. and I can share that with you, which is just taking their image. So if I were to stop sharing my video right now, this is what would happen, yeah. right? It shows that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I don't think Restream has a way to populate that with an image. So what I would do is I'd take take this down into a video editing software. Nothing super fancy. I just add an image of myself or the person really over that block, cropped yeah. with their face. I think that works because there's still the visual cue of when I'm talking versus when they're talking. Because uh, I'll be here with my mouth shut, um, and so that that might work. Right. And I think that's like my backup plan if anybody ever doesn't want to be visual. Yeah. So I always I've try got, to give a heads up, though. Yeah. No, I've, 
So I've got sort of two. So all the ones I've done in the past, I'm using um, through my. Um, so I, I use Blueberry as my podcast host. They've got an, um, an arrangement with Headliner. Is it Headliner I use? I think it is. Um, so they can either do like sort of a ten minute clip of the the thing where they you produce a sort of a visually bit that I can then right. put on YouTube. So I'm I'm actually going back over my old episodes now. Um, so I can use some artwork and it's got a movementy bit with with the speech. So very similar to what you're talking about. But it's not the entire thing. It's just it's a ten minute blurb, um, ten minute extract that I can then I can post, but then sort of post a link to and here's the audio. You know, um, I could probably do the entire episodes like that. I just haven't got round to uh, to making that work yet. So um, yeah, that, that's kind of a work in progress. Um, yeah. But the next, I, I'm trying to also get the balance right between. I quite like to do an interview and say, right, that that go live on Monday or within two weeks because I try, I try and do a, a fortnightly thing. Um, but I've had a um, also backlog recently, um, so I've actually been more more organised than I usually am. And and people are do. Um, I've got a few interviews going out and just trying to plan getting people getting people in um, and getting getting you know getting content out there in a sort of a. a, a in a timely manner but in a good cadence as well so um yeah trying to plan that sort of stuff yeah i'll i'll, I'll, I'll see somebody and so sort of say oh can you come and talk about that and it's time sensitive and so then that shifts my entire um uh the the, the, the the whole plan but it's worth it if it's if it's for a you know a good topic yeah um, yeah um, i uh yeah i i feel that um and i I, I always like to say if if people are developing content, come up with a list of stuff that you would like to do because you'll forget. And if you are prepared with a list, you'll at least have a, a bunch of stuff that you can ev eventually get to, right? So like anyone who's listening or watching wants to get involved with our lab, we have a whole host of projects that people could work on to boost their portfolios if they truly feel passionate about it we we you know we want to basically um have that stuff uh lined up for uh for the folks that want to work on it and so we always come up with ideas right i think we've talked about several of them may not necessarily come to fruition right away they could someday uh and yeah. having that list is important so i think we've just met in the middle I think we are pretty much there. Yeah. Um, just that. Cool. Uh, so, yes, because I started at the top of March and started going down. So we haven't made in the middle at all. It's just because I didn't go oh. and start down at the bottom properly. I had to find out where the start of March was. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah okay. So no, well, if if you start uh, at the bottom, then I can I can work through March then. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's cool. That's fine. Um, okay. Yeah. So let's see here. Oh, smart farming. We did that one on the show so I can go ahead and get rid of that. I yeah. I don't know. Uh, content creation is, is interesting. Um, it's, it's interesting in this space because there's not a lot of people doing it. There are, certainly people with podcasts uh and uh i've you know i was one of those people that was doing things as a podcast slowly i realized though that um just podcasting and i don't mean this as a slight <laughs> is kind gonna, of lazy. Gonna be offended in a minute. It, it's it's kind of lazy content creation. Yeah, and um, oh, just a friend, uh, text from friend of the show, uh, saying it's getting crazy out there regarding something, and I need to check what this craziness is because this could be a decision that I need to make. Uh, live, um, oh. which uh, I think. no, we're okay. We're okay. Do not need to make any live decisions. Let's just say it's with <laughs> with investments. <laughs> right. Enough. Uh, let's see here. 
hearings committee. Oh yeah, transportation. That's right. That is something that I would like to bring up. This is a fun one. I'll do green for me. Did I say green for me, blue for you? I can't remember it. I haven't been doing it. So okay. Anyway, uh, anyway we can go, go back and whatever you want. Um, later. Uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I think um, podcasting is kind of lazy content creation because it's just recording you talk. And in a lot of cases, you can get away with a lot just talking. Um, and not that that's necessarily a bad thing. It obviously makes for interesting discussion most times. In fact, we had success with the show just from talking, and that's fine. But the more I realized that it is kind of a safer route to go. The more I wanted to branch out and kind of go um, into more risky avenues like video, because that is a commitment that people come to expect. And they, they expect a certain level of polish with video, which is interesting to me that like you definitely judge of book by its cover more frequently when you're looking at video, right? Like, yes. let's say, uh, you know, you, you find a new YouTube channel and their camera is down, facing up at their chin. There's no microphone. There's no setup. You know, like, we both have visually appealing backgrounds here. I have a That's lot going on. Nerd stuff up top, books down bottom, lightsabers over here. There's stuff to look at behind me. For you, there's stuff on your wall. You got that. Look at that. What's that over your right shoulder? I have no idea what all that stuff is. There's a couch there. Like, oh, just I've got sofa. I've got so the bits. So again, the 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 air platforms you can see on. The, so they're planes I've worked on, and so I'm trying to use it almost. You know, people talk about having an eagle wall, that type portfolio. of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to have a bit of that sort of things that are relevant to the sort of stuff I've been up to. So um, I thought I've never done that before. So I thought I'd start. So around I've got pictures of platforms I've worked on. And and then the certificate that will be on the top. So over my, you know, that sure that that one there is an award I got earlier this year for mo for my for the podcast. Oh, um, for being you, a... Wait, are you telling me you are an award winning podcast? No, I'm not. I'm a highly commended oh, okay. podcast. All so right. I missed out on. So basically, I, I was entered into the communications award at last at the last ergonomics uh, at this year's awards for the uh, part of the CIHF, and um, and basically I came second, or I came joint second place. Which I, I'm, I'm not. I've got to be honest. I'm not a very good loser. Who who but, came um, in first? And is there any way that I can replace you with them on it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you can, but they run a website, so um, oh, okay. I, right. I should know this, but there's um, they they got um, um, a, a, a website full of human factors tools and techniques, um, and I should know what it is, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. See, you um, you uh, you may have taken that loss, but to me, I in, in something like that. I would look at it and be like, hmm, I want them on my show. Uh, <laughs> or like, um, yeah. you know. No, that's what I've sort of done with a lot of this. So I, um, there's been a number of things that I, I sort of stuck my neck out for a bit this year. And um, and I've basically took, used that to sort of say, well, okay, I didn't win that, but uh, the person who beat me, they're going to be, um, I'm, like say, oh, you beat me, well done. Now you've got to be a guest on my show to talk about it. Um, yeah. And so, yes, there's going to be, so I, the other thing I did was stand for um, stand to be the president of the CIHF, and um, and I didn't get it. So the but the chap who who beat me he's promised to come on as a on as a guest, and so which I'm quite looking forward to. So I need to get that teed up for the new year, um, but it should be quite good fun because um, he's into motorbikes and stuff. So I think that that's a different type of. Um, of HF stuff, which I think will be quite a, quite a good laugh to, yeah. to play with. So yeah, motorcycles. Uh, I used to ride before I had a kid, uh, and before uh, I got married and started having other humans other than myself care about my. Not that my parents didn't, but like you know, uh, you're I young know. and anyway. So 
I stopped writing and it's insanely dangerous. Um, even if you take all the safety precautions, it's just one of those insane things where you're like, there was, there was a quote that I read while I was writing, not, not while I was actually writing, but (laughs) in the time that I was writing, I was reading a lot of articles on writing and there was a quote and I wish I could remember the full thing, but it was something like, there's nothing that sort of beats the life affirming action or the life affirming focus that you have while you're on a bike. You look away for one second and you're dead and you have to have so much focus when you ride. And I think that's what was so therapeutic about it for me is because it's not like I need, um, you know, I, I didn't need a phone up for navigation or anything. I knew where I was going when I was riding had it pre-planned in my head. So the only things I was paying attention to was, okay, what are the intentions of that driver? What What's the next move that I'm going to make to avoid risk? And it was all about risk avoidance. And it was this really interesting state of flow that you would get into as a writer. And I would be lying if I said I didn't miss that state of flow. I don't miss the exposure to danger. And I just wish there was another way to get into that state of flow. But I think it was... I got there because I was paying so close attention to not dying. And yeah. it, it's just crazy. It's crazy to try to describe. Uh, I don't know. Are, are you a writer? Have you ever? Um... I, I I dabbled very briefly. Um, in fact, there's for ages I was thinking, yes, it'd be great to get a motorbike and just do like commuting and stuff like that. I think I thought it would be it'd be cool. And um, but um, uh, my wife was very much of the uh, not so much. I think that's a uh. daft idea. Um, and, and so I, uh, me being a dutiful husband said, um, yes, of course you're right. And I'm not going to do that. Um, so then when she, our, um, my in-laws lived in the States at the time. And so she went out to, um, out to St. Louis to go and see them. And, um, and so when they were away, I did my, um, my, uh, initial motorbike test while, they, while she was gone and in a different country. <laughs> um, yeah. So did that but then it was really weird so we we have to do a thing called a cbt a um which is like a pre-test um to make you have to do a, a mini test to make sure that you're it's like a, a fundamental a day's course to make sure you've got the basics of motorbike riding before you get your learner license and right. then you can do your learn a bit and then you take your proper test um so i did this thing called the c compulsory oh, compulsory basic training that was called um and so i did i did the day's course and and it was fine i got my cbt but I came up to, I sort of got that real thing that I really don't know what's going on. Um, they, there was so much traffic going around and all this sort of stuff that I was like, I'm just not safe. I really am just just not safe for this. Um, wow, what have you done to my phone? Um, oh, I see. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I just then decided um, we're not doing that anymore. So I didn't. Yep. Um, yeah. Part of me says, I, you know, I'd still like to, but you, as you quite rightly say, the, um, the, the, just the quick chance of death. And I've had so, I've had friends who've had accidents. I've had friends who've unfortunately died. I've had, you know, you just yeah. sort of sit there and go, just, it's just not safe. It's, it's not. Um, I, I still remember like some close calls that I had that were just like, uh, you know, and too, too much to try to deal with. Cause it was, you know, I was, I was heading home. It was a routine drive. Uh, from my place of work and I took a corner a little hard and the um, the the sprinklers were running on the side of the road and it had run off onto the street so it made it slick I turned the corner the back wheel flew out from behind me I put my foot down stupidly in reactionary and yes. kind of course corrected to where the bike kind of re you know righted itself and I, I went, wow, that was close. And then I thought to myself, wow, that was really close. I could have broken my foot. And then I thought, uh, I was just really lucky overall. Um, so you could have broken many other things as well. And there, you know, there are certainly times where people here in the States, you can, or at least in California, you could split the lane and go down, um, you know, two rows of traffic. And, you know, I do that because they're fairly spread out here. And so you do that sometimes and people like to challenge that 
who are in vehicles. And so they'll like scoot in to the other car. And so like, you know, I hit, I hit uh, somebody's side view mirror <laughs> and you know, my mirror just goes all the way around, wraps back into the place where it was. It just did one full 360 degree turn was right there. Um, but their mirror, I think got smashed. I don't know. I just kept riding cause I was yeah. upset. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, a little bit, a couple extra inches and I would have been on the ground and you see some of these dash cam videos. It's just insane. <sighs> anyway, yeah. I think that's a nice, cheerful way to uh, wrap up the evening. I think it looks like we're done with all that stuff. So looks like maybe, um, you know, next week we can, or not next week because nope. next week's Thanksgiving here Two in the stuff. States and you got a party to go to. I've got a, yes, I've got a, um, a, a black tie dinner and awards dinner. Yeah, I'm quite looking forward to that. It'll be good. Um, cool. Helps know you're getting something before you go. All right. So. Well, uh, for anyone who's been hanging out with us, thank you. Really appreciate it. And uh, we won't be back next week, but the week after, I guess, with the second, what I say? It was the second? Is that right? Second. Uh, December 2. Yes. December 2, we will be back. We will be back. Yes. Uh, in the UK, that's December 3rd. But in December 3rd in the UK. And yes. our stuff actually goes out on the 3rd or on the Friday. This is live, but then, you know, it goes out late evening. Most people see it on Friday. That's true. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Barry. You have a great award ceremony, and I will see you potentially on the 2nd if you're down to moonlight again. That sounds awesome. <laughs> have yourself a great couple of weeks, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving. And um, Thank you. And we shall um, catch you then. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.